So today is our 14th body trial update. And so we've been doing these for a few months now. And what I'm really excited to talk with all of you about today is partly the composition of people who are starting to show up. Like Evan is here. Um, Evan, I'm really glad to see you've joined us. Iris is here, which we need to talk soon because uh, we need to start plotting and scheming how to do for Osa Peninsula what we're doing in Barichara right now um, and other, other mutual exchanges. I know we have a lot to learn from you too. And, um, and for some reason, I'm feeling like Benji to me is a representative of the other piece of what we're doing, which is how do we figure out how to create general learning approaches that can bring us together in what we're doing uh, so that this can truly be bioregion to bioregion across the planet. And so um, what, I, what I feel will be the, the best way to have the call today is first, I'm not gonna give any kind of a presentation. I've been so busy um, with lots of meetings and activities related to Refi Barichara and with all of the flurry of activity for the two week Gitcoin matching round, which ends today, that uh, what I really wanna do is just share with you what all of that flurry of activity is and what it's trying to become. Say so it's trying to become in the sense that we have an aspirational future that doesn't yet exist. And so this aspirational future is partly what I wanna talk about today is what are we really doing in Barichara? Like, what are we really doing? What is, what is the big picture of this? And, and what is the concrete detail? What are the little pieces of it? And what isn't, what isn't working? And, and um, Penny's yours. <laughs> um, and, and what I wanna do really in a sense is, is just paint a bit of the picture of what's been keeping us so busy. And then what I wanna do is start having a dialogue about questions you might have, um, comments you have. Those of you who have been around this process for a while, what do you see that's new and changing? Those of you who are just showing you, where you're, with your fresh eyes, what are you seeing that some of us who have been around for a while may not be seeing? And, and I sense that um, we're in a very special moment. And so I'm just gonna close that so it doesn't beep at us anymore, there we go. I, and that is that we're in a moment where um, what we're doing right now, like in this moment in Bari Chara, is we're going from something I've talked about for a few years to something we're actually doing. And that is I've talked about it enough and we've done enough and accomplished enough that what we've talked about doing is actually possible to do. And so what I wanna do is just to give a little bit of a picture of what's happening right now is I wanna explain what's going on with the preparations for Refi Bari Chara. What happened last Sunday at the Refi Bari Chara Mapathon that our friends Klaus and Sev hosted? And that it's sort of a pedagogical entryway, you know, like a new way of learning that we're going to hold for five full days in our physical event that starts on October 3rd. And what the Gitcoin funding round really means. Because some of you participating in the Gitcoin funding round, some of you had never touched anything related to crypto before, and you only showed up because Penny and I are people you care about and trust. And you're like, if they say it's okay, it can't be all bad. And some of you have been around this block for a while and, and know what the potentials are of these different technologies, but also know that they're not road ready yet. You know, they're not really ready to take out into the world because the usability is difficult, because the tools aren't finished because nation states are trying to destroy them um, because of a bunch of reasons, quite honestly. Um, because of narcissistic psychopaths, as happens everywhere in the capitalist world, playing their stupid games with Bitcoin and with other things and making the whole damn space confusing. And so anyway, um, what I wanna do is tell you that today at 7 p.m. Central Time, the Gitcoin matching round will end. And at that time, $350,000 will be allocated to all of the projects in the climate solutions cause round, which is where our project is. And I've been watching the estimated matches over the last few days and we have no idea what the match is gonna be because there's so much activity on that platform that we can't say. Like right now it says, if you give $100, you'll get a match of $600 and it was $1,200 a few days ago. But 
we've increased the number of contributors by 70 people in the last 48 hours, and our share of the match keeps going down. Which just means that there's so much activity trying to figure out how to distribute these funds across a fairly large number of projects that we have no idea what the amount is gonna be. But it's currently estimating at about $25,000, which puts us somewhere in the top six or seven projects in the climate solutions round. So we're, we're one of the winners, if you wanted to say that. But actually, I wouldn't call us winners because we're not competing with the other projects. And this is what's really interesting about the last two weeks is that a little bit over two weeks ago, Tyler Hruby, who's here in Barichara with us, said, can I write the, the grant proposal for the Gitcoin round because I really think we should be there. And I was like, yes, please, because I don't have time. And then he wrote, you know, based on all the other things I'd written, he put together this beautiful summary and we got it in in time and got it reviewed and approved. And then the Gitcoin round started 14 days ago. And then what we've done for the last 14 days, and part of the reason that Penny and I look a little more tired than usual, is that we started setting up training camps. We started on-ramping people into the crypto world. We started doing real-world community organizing, Cesar Chavez style, for those of you who know what that is. You know, go door to door knocking on your neighbor's uh, doors while you figure out how to tell your own story as it relates to the cause. Because by the way, in our pledge community, we've also been teaching people how to tell their personal stories instead of fundraising. And so those of you in the pledge community have been participating in that. And we're figuring out a way to tell the story of what it is we're actually doing. And so part of what's happened is, as we started giving people Ethereum to be able to donate to Gitcoin because we trained them to do it, which by the way, trying to put crypto on your wallet is one of the broken points. It's amazingly difficult to do um, because the centralized financial system is very threatened by crypto, trying to make it very difficult, is that um, we started building alliances with other people as we helped bring funding to them. So we said, here's $25 worth of Ethereum. We want you to give $2 to our project and $2 to at least one of a list of other projects. And we had 11 other projects that we initially curated, all of which were aligned with our work in bioregional regeneration in one way or another. And one thing that's done is it's brought people from those other projects more into alignment with us, more into awareness of what we're actually doing. And some of them have decided to come to the Refi Bari Chara event. And some of them, like Evan, who's here, who I didn't know a week ago, are actually building some of the tools that we need to do what we're trying to do. And if they didn't know about us and we didn't know about them, we wouldn't be able to do it together. And so what's really interesting is this weaving of human beings around new capacities that did not exist 14 days ago. And we're probably gonna walk away with $25,000 in our pocket from the Gitcoin round to go directly into projects on the ground in Bari Chara. So that's pretty sweet. But at the same time, we've been designing the Refi Bari Chara event. And I wanna tell you how that works because there are two major sort of catalyzing creative processes that are telling us what the Refi Barichara event should be. One of them was proposed by our friend Klaus, who is in the most recent learning journey in Earth Regenerators. He's been a friend of mine for a few years. Klaus has a, a company called Hack Humanity and he's one of those really good facilitators of open collaboration and creative processes. You know, total like tech innovation nerd, really a sweet guy from New Zealand. He's trying to find his way back to his home country. He's been in Greece for the last little while, uh, figuring out that that's not where he should stay. And Klaus said, I would like to offer a mapathon for Refi Bari Chara. So let's have a call to talk about what that is. And for him, he had done hackathons for a long time. And hackathons are usually technology-based where you have some problem and you bring a bunch of technology or design people together. And in the span of a few hours or a few days, you hack a solution to the problem through rapid prototyping. You rapidly innovate solutions with a facilitated process. And he said, I wanna do that, but I wanna do it as a mapping process. I wanna map the projects of Bari Chara to the people who are coming to refi Bari Chara, so the people who are coming can earnestly create value and contribute to those local projects. And Klaus is partnering with a guy named Sev, 
who works with Regen Network, which is, he's one of those really nice guys that everyone knows and respects. And he and his partner, Sam, do really good work. And they map, they figure out how do you measure ecological value? And then how do you track value flow within a local economy? And then how do you bring that into alignment with economic development so you can actually invest in ecological restoration and improve the quality of, of your economy at the same time? Which is pretty cool. And so Sev and Sam are coming to Bar HR for our event. They're actually gonna use the digital nomad visa that's as of today is legally available in Columbia. Um, or it will be at the end of October when yeah. they reopen the immigration office. By the way, I don't have my visa and probably won't for multiple more months for those of you who know that, that tragic epic narrative that I'm in. Um, it is nowhere near over. Um, but what's happening that's fascinating is this, is that Klaus and Sev decided to host a Mapathon and they asked me to gather information about local projects. So I did what we always do in Bari Chara is I went to Natalia Ortiz. Those of you who come to Refi Bari Chara will get to meet Natalia. She's one of those, I don't know, um, she's like one of those special human beings that deserves to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And she's like a world-class social entrepreneur. And she's like fucking amazing. And you deserve, you should like drop F-bombs for how awesome she is because she's so amazing. And she worked in like international conservation work and community development and with you know empowerment of women and all the various things in between for like 20 years until she got so disgusted with international NGOs that she became a yoga instructor in the jungle near Panama for a couple of years just to heal from how terrible the international NGO space was. Um, anyway, Natalia is, is our most important social weaver in the territory. Now she's certainly not alone because her partner Yvonne is, you know, very close in badassery to, to <laughs> Natalia. It's just that Natalia deserves some special, um, you know, some special commentary. And so what happened was Natalia and I had a call where I said, we need to gather information about local projects. And of course, most of the local projects don't speak English. We need to create a mapathon in English. So can I create a Google form with a questionnaire? And then we create a list of projects and we create some kind of taxonomy for those projects so that we can be strategic about combining, combining them with each other. And I'll create a Spanish language Google Forms. And then can we recruit a volunteer from a Colombian university who can actually go out and interview the people from these 20 different projects? And Natalia jumps in gear and starts mapping the taxonomy, creating the list of projects and their leaders, recruiting the volunteer who's gonna gather the interviews. And we didn't get to 20, we got to 12, but we were able to create mapping of 12 projects from the leaders themselves in Spanish, translate them into English for a mapathon that happened on Sunday of this week. <clears throat> and what happened was this, was Natalia said, how do you wanna think about this event and what are you trying to accomplish and how could this actually help local projects? We don't want more neo-colonialism. We don't want people from the outside coming and learning from what we're doing and then taking it away, but it actually didn't help local people. And I said, talking about the vision of what this, what this event is. And we said, you know, we really want to understand for people from the outside, we want them to understand that this is not just ecological restoration. We want them to know ecological restoration is a very important part of it. We're gonna show them people trying to restore watersheds, doing reforestation, you know, teaching kids nature connections so they can become guardians of water supplies. And, you know, we wanna do that, that's all important. But also we wanna focus on the economic models. So let's look at the transformation of local food systems. This network called Muheri Vita, which is almost 50 Campesino families led by women who have been creating alternative economic models since the mid 1990s. And they've been at this for a long time. And now we're creating a community market. And now the community market will be owned by the producers who are the agroforestry practitioners. And we need to map those supply chains. And so we'll need to focus on economic models. And then also we need to focus on social or cultural processes. Obviously that's artificially separated from the other two, but it's just a point of focus. We wanna talk about the women's circles for trauma healing and how those trauma healing and women's circles enable the economic models to be developed. We wanna talk about the community theater uh, focused on children, giving children imaginative narratives to re-envision their futures and helping them form deep connections to the history of colonialism and conquest 
the need for different models and different stories, the end of civilization and all these other things that the kids need to be preparing themselves for, which we might call cultural processes instead of economics, just to give it a focus. And so that's how we categorize those projects for the mapping. Then what happened on Sunday was this. We had about 15 people come to our mapathon. It was two and a half hours long. We recorded it and I have it on YouTube so I could share it for anyone who'd like to see it. And we took um, about five of these projects is all we got through in the two and a half hours because it was so rich to have people exploring you know, what do you see as the pattern level of these projects and what they can offer and what they're good at? What needs do they really have and what solutions might we imagine creating that could actually help them? And of course, for people from the outside, that means they need really thick contextual understanding. So I was there just continually offering insights about the projects and the people involved and the local politics and the corruption in the mayor's office and you know the kinds of things that say well you might think that's a way to solve it but it actually isn't but here's a little more information let's change our idea of the solutions and we got through five projects five projects in two and a half hours but what happened during those two and a half hours was we held the complexity of the territory and we showed people how they could think about each project as part of a fabric and all the projects are connected to each other. And they're all connected to each other in the complexity of the real world. And we never reduced the complexity. We never pretended a project was isolated. And so in two and a half hours, people practiced bioregional regeneration thinking. And then two days ago, I met with Natalia and Yvonne and another woman, Margarita, who a lot of you hear me talk about a lot because Margarita is helping build this patterning of transforming the local food system by just weaving with lots of different people across the territory. And the four of us sat down together to talk about the immersion experiences for the Refi Bari Chara event, which is basically, we were calling them the field site visits, but then we evolved the concept during our conversation. So we had to change it. It's like, I'm just gonna call them immersions because they're so complex and nuanced that I don't think any other name properly captures them. And so what we decided to do is this. We said, there are gonna be somewhere between 40 and 60 people coming to Refine Bar HR. Although if Antonio keeps doing his thing at Cosmoverse, he might show up in a giant party bus with 200 or more people because <laughs> Cosmoverse is gonna have a few thousand people and who the hell knows. But right now we have what, 45, almost 45 people confirmed that they're definitely coming. And we might land at about 60 by the time we're done. And we've got amazing people who are coming and it's gonna be awesome. So the number of people doesn't really matter. It's just gonna be a fantastic group of people. But what we did was we started designing these immersion experiences. And so this is the kind of thing that happens when you have a pro-social group of like world-class social innovators all who deeply know and love their own territory. So they know all the people, they're friends with all the people. And if they say, I think so-and-so that, I think we could create a group of artists that could demonstrate local art in indigenous styles using local materials. Oh, well, there's Arturo and there's Orlando and I'll go call so-and-so. You know, it's like, that, that's sort of what happens in these meetings. And so what we came to is that we would divide the participants into three groups and we would have three immersions so that each group goes through all three immersions. And every day, all three immersions happen in parallel because the event starts on a Monday, but in the afternoon, we'll have an opening ceremony. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are full days. And then Friday is like a half day or a little bit more than a half day. We'll end in the early afternoon. And so Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we're gonna have these mornings of immersions. And the idea evolved a lot during the three hours. But what we came to, were these three ideas, which I'm sure will evolve more by the time it actually happens. So use these as like placeholders of whatever it's actually gonna be. As we realized that we wanted to have experiences that would create this feeling of territorial weaving and connectivity while, while really highlighting those three elements of ecological restoration, economic models, economic development, and cultural processes. And so we actually designed all three of them to have all three themes, but in different ways. And so one of them was just a physical geography 
well, Joe's going to be taking people to Las Albercas, the land of the ecoversity. But wait, maybe they should actually start at the Bio Parque because it's right at the top of town. And then they should walk to the Tabaris Trail, which is this multi-thousand-year-old ancestral footpath. And at the top is, is a stone sculpture made by our friend Vito, a set of spiral rocks, and she's making the space feel sacred. And we'll talk about how to enter into the sacred territory of the Guane people that live below. And then we'll enter their territory, and we'll share the story of bringing a watershed back to life and restoring a river and the work of the neighboring land and the land of Las Albercas and the story of the Barichar Ecoversity. And we'll go visit the land, crossing the land of our neighbors as we do it. And then we'll have this immersion experience in visiting the Bio Parque, seeing a Centropic Agroforestry project, learning about this first community project, learning about the Camino Real system, which is the network of ancestral footpaths that connect the territory, and then enter into a territorial patterning of neighborly cooperation to restore a watershed and tell the story of the ecoversity. And that'll be one of our immersions. So in like three or four hours, we'll just explore those spaces in one of the groups. And then another one of the groups we'll take to a place called Fundacion Monte Chico, where they teach children, like elementary school and middle school kids, how to use native plants to make natural textiles for clothing, uh, weaving for baskets and other kinds of uh, household use items, how to make natural color dyes from uh, native plants. And they'll have this immersive experience and also bioconstruction and building materials made from native plants and native mud and stone. And then they'll go to Margarita's house, which is going to be called, they're actually creating a space called Casa Comun, the commons house, which is where the community kitchen, community market, and the transformation of local plants into local foods and unprocessed foods that are sold into the local tourism economy, where they'll have an experience of the transformation of resources. The transformation of resources with an educational component for children, with what is basically a food forest system that's up at the top of town, uh, a nature reserve where they have all these native plants they're using to make textiles and natural dyes, and have an experience of all those materials, and then go into a space where they're creating a community market and transforming lots of local food products into food and have an exploration of economic models and the transformation of local resources and begin to explore what does it mean to weave among all the members of the community in these transformational processes where you take you know, a succulent plant and turn it into a basket or you turn it into medicine or you turn it into food and how does all that work in a local economy? And that's all within the town of Barichara, so it'll just be a walking tour within the town. And then the third thing we're gonna be doing is taking people to a place called Ojo de Agua, Eye of Water, which is the community theater out in the countryside with the couple, Emil Se and Oscar, who have been creating community processes with children for more than 10 years, where they teach the children how to create documentaries, and teach them photography and interviews. And then the kids go out and start interviewing the elders, creating documentaries or creating theatrical performances. And they become guardians of watersheds and they stimulate processes of building trust and peace building among neighbors who have a history of violence and begin enabling watershed restoration processes through those cultural patterning with the children. And people get a really powerful experience of this trauma healing process connected to education with children and the patterning of restoration of trust and collaboration between neighbors. And then they'll go to a 14 hectare finca called Agua Santa or Holy Water, which is a place that is a regenerative agroforestry project. They're restoring a watershed. They're demonstrating lots of different agroforestry products, but they're also the nexus of 14 neighboring farms that have been cooperating to maintain and build food resilience for the entire territory. And so we'll bring other members of the community from that region to start showing how a network of neighbors can actually build a regional economic system while doing watershed and soil restoration with functioning and economically viable business models for agroforestry systems. And so the idea is in these three different immersions, which each of which will last for three or four hours, people will experience different ways that the territorial weaving is occurring that is spread across ecological restoration, 
cultural patterns of healing and collaboration together with the development of economic models. And the, these will feed into the afternoon activities, which is where we'll have emergent design sessions, which I'll be facilitating five days of emergence. So we're not gonna have a set agenda for the design emergence. We're gonna co-create them in the moment based on what's arising for the participants. And what I wanted to share with you in this is that we are gathering together people who are coming to this event who build models and build tools for exactly these kinds of projects that almost never get the opportunity to apply them to a real world landscape or a real world community. And what we're building toward is the capacity to prototype these landscape scale tool sets, these landscape scale design processes, and then take them to other landscapes later. And so I wanted to share this with you to give you a more of a sense of how we're building alliances, raising money, gathering people with tools and knowledge who can collaboratively build some of the systems that we need while we are designing a process of territorial integration for teaching by our regional design that directly brings benefits back to the local community and the local projects. Now, I think this needs to replace ecotourism. Whatever this is that we're creating needs to become the replacement for ecotourism. Um, people come and they bring money. And we've made a principal decision that all the money that's coming in for the event is going to cover the cost of the event and pay local people, like all of the field sites we're going to, we're paying them to, to showcase their work. And then whatever surplus money there is, is going into the Territorial Foundation to support local projects afterwards. And of course, all the money from the Gitcoin grant is all going directly to those local projects as well. So we're building the, a funding model for our landscape. And we're building a funding model with learning and collaboration around how to design tools and how to collaborate to design the tools in a way that we want to leverage from this landscape and other landscapes in the future which is why, Iris, I'm glad you're here because I know that it won't be too long before we can bring what we're doing to the Osa Peninsula in Costa Rica and to other landscapes. And so we just need to be thinking about how best to do that. And also how to build the support system for these alliance partners. Because some of the people who are coming are coming with struggles to get here. It's expensive to come to an event like this. And we're trying to figure that out, but what we want to get to is with the decentralized aspect of Web3 and crypto. And I really want to emphasize this. A lot of people talk about the problems with crypto and almost all of those problems are real problems. So it's not like people are being dismissive of the tech. There are a lot of problems with the tech in the crypto space. But there's one thing that the crypto space is doing really well, which is it is creating ways to collaborate in a decentralized manner without ever having the need to create a central authority. And this is a really big deal. It's a really big deal. So I've been having great conversations in the last few months with Benji about top-down versus bottom-up approaches to bioregional weaving. And when we look at like the international NGO space working with national governments and with multinational corporations, and they are so entrenched in colonialism and so entrenched in the globalized capitalist system that it's almost impossible to do what's needed with them, even though they are full of good human beings doing the best that they can. Just those systems are so damn entrenched. And if you look at all of the ways that we have funded our work in Barichara, you know, the Barichara Regeneration Fund raising $50,000 with crowdfunding, mostly on Twitter, to buy a piece of land and set up the Barichara Regeneration Fund and then stimulate integration of 15 local projects. Could you imagine an international NGO doing what we did? Maybe there are a few of them out there, but most of them know. And what we're doing now, blending into the crypto space, working with Gitcoin, working with Regen Network, leaning into the space of Holochain, where you're like, wait, Holochain and, and Cosmos, and like these things, do they actually play together? Like, not enough. They don't play together enough, but we're all developing different tool sets for the same design challenge. The design challenge is to create a regenerated earth. Most of us don't know that's the design challenge, 
And it turns out that a design challenge is to create a planetary network of bioregional experiments. And as more people gradually figure out that's what it is, they're gonna look at what we're doing now and they're gonna to wanna to play. And we're gonna to have to figure out how to help them play. And so that's why I wanted to just tell you the story of what's been happening in the last two weeks, help you start to see the creative process because it's absolutely dizzying in complexity. Is dizzying in complexity. And yet, this is the minimum of what we need to be doing from here on out. We need to be able to achieve these scales of collaboration in a sustained manner in the next several years while the collapse patterns intensify. And I just want to give that example that I use a lot. If we take the business as usual scenario from the limits to growth study, which has been disturbingly accurate at tracking reality, even though it was not a prediction. It was merely a scenario. But what that scenario showed was that sometime around right now, sometime in the early 2020s, there would be a volatility in the energy sector due to resource scarcities. So think of peak oil as your placeholder of all the rest, there'd be resource scarcity in the energy sector, which would create price volatility for energy, which would cascade across supply chains and food prices, which would create large scale civil unrest. And the human population would stop growing around 2030 to 2040, somewhere in that time frame. But what does it mean for the human population to stop growing? That means the death rate grows to meet the exponential growth of the growth rate. The growth rate is exponential. It's growing exponentially, which means the death rate between now and 2030 would have to grow faster than the growth rate of the growth rate. You following that? So right now, instead of having like half a billion new people per year coming into being, we're gonna have more than half a billion people per year dying to balance the growth rate. And then after that, the population plummets to somewhere like one or two billion. And this is a scenario, it's not reality. It's a computer simulation from 1972. But what that computer simulation tells us is that ecological uh, overshoot and planetary limits is gonna do something like that. So I use that as my thinking tool, not because it's the truth, but because it's a useful heuristic to plan with. If I was gonna pretend that things are gonna get better in the next 10 years, I would be absolutely delusional. And so what we need to do is design these decentralized systems that can grow in resilience as other systems collapse, as other systems get worse. And so we've gotta get really good at collaborating and we need decentralized systems to do it. And so, so that's where we're at. What I'd love to do is just invite a dialogue about what it means to be doing this work right now with this beautiful moment of focus in Barichara because of Cosmoverse and DEF CON, because that was attracting enough people from the Web3 space, because our friend Antonio Paglino saw that coming and suggested we host the satellite event, and then because Tyler suggested we enter the Gitcoin round. Notice. I'm not the one who suggested these things. I'm just dancing with improvisation. I'm good at improv. So I'm holding my part of the field, but none of these were my ideas, these things that are happening now, but I'm dancing with the field. And now we all need to dance with the field because what we're trying to do right now is like we're in a moment of creativity that if we get this right, we will figure out how to create an upward cycle of circulation that can bring people into capacity to collaborate further within bioregions. In anchor bioregions on earth while the world goes to shit, you know, like while things get really, really bad. And so that's the place we're in. And so I just wanna know what are you thinking, feeling? What, what are your reactions, your reflections, what your questions, just anything. And because there are 15 of us here, just um, or 16 of us with Penny and my screen, I just use the hand hold, you know, the hand raising option down in the reactions bar. Um, and I'd love to hear from you. Benji. 
Yeah, what a beautiful vision. I'm so excited. I wish I could be down there. And uh, that makes me wonder, how can we be down there in some sense remotely? Uh, is there any opportunity for the bioregional catalyst to sort of be there in some sense without it being turning into like a reality TV show? Could we host campfires once a day without being a distraction and inviting anybody who's participating to come stop by and chat? Um, just trying to think of, of ways to uh, help to observe lessons and distill lessons and distribute lessons while this, um, I don't know, creative chaos unfolds. Um, I want to mention that Paula, who is here on the call, is going to be physically with us at the event, and she's already made the decision that she wants to do daily reporting. So she's going to try and, and share the story every day. And so what we might do is create something like a little communications team, a little pod. And so collaborate with Paula on this. And one thing that comes to mind is to have something like an Earth Regenerators happy hour, which is a Zoom call. That is at a moment where we don't have organized activities for Refi Barichara, but that people could come on and just share what's going on with the outside world. And then we would record and publish them, just you know, like we're recording this call could be something, I just made that up, so that may or may not be the best idea. Stephen is bringing video and audio equipment, as he just said. So, um, so we could also create a little film crew of some kind um, if we can self-organize it. So Paula, I don't know what you think about that, if you want to chat with Benji about it or gather a little group of people so it's not your responsibility, but we have enough shared responsibility, it can happen. Um, but that, that's one way I could see that going. Okay, yeah, that sounds great. And it, it's this is something we can discuss in this Friday's exploratory session in the Bioregional Catalyst as well. Maybe come up with some ideas together. I'm happy to facilitate. I'm thinking Rachel as well might like to get involved. So yeah, we can organize a little side conversation. That sounds great. Nice, nice. And then are there other questions, comments, meditations, freakouts, reflections, whatever? <laughs> <laughs> Just want to hear from you. Um, I'm avoiding freaking out. <laughs> um, oh, oh, Michael Dowd. I was like trying to remember his name. I start. Michael just released a couple videos in the past two days, um, and he just he just like there's you and two others, Michael and the Nate Hagens. Like just take it on full, the <laughs> collapse. And I'm just I'm aware of how much I'm still like I want to say whistling in the dark. It's just like a, I there's the part of me that refuses to believe that this is happening. And in some ways that's probably good because I wouldn't I'm not paralyzed completely curled up in bed just sobbing. Um, yet there's also a sense. I should be allowing more room for grief or whatever. And I step back and I just, you know, the process is going however it's going. I'm not gonna fight it. It's just noticing where I'm resisting, opening up more to that. Because there's also the other side is just like, wow, this is really, this is really exciting. This is, I I think I said this some version previously when I first discovered Earth Regenerators, this feels like what I've been living for for 60 years. Um, so I guess it's just being with the the swirl of emotions that that and thoughts that pass through me, and uh, yeah, hanging on and letting go at the same time. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for saying that, Stephen. Because I actually feel like there are two things we have to get really good at. We have to get really good at discernment, so we have to discern what's really going on, and then we have to get really good at collective sense making, which is, I mean, it at both levels. You need to discern your own way of making decisions, and we need to find the people that we can discern together with. And that doesn't mean we agree on every single thing. That would not be very helpful. You know, that would just create a, a muddled middle. So we don't have to agree on everything. That's not the point of this at all. But it's that we are discerning together. And so, so thank you for sharing that, Claire and then RJ. So on to you, Claire. Yeah, I just uh, I just really want to um, 
Oh my gosh, thank you so much for bringing in the level of complexity of storytelling that you are trying to do here. And how, uh, it's not just rare, it almost never happens. I, I just, um, and I, I would just love to also give a shout out to Trisha and Iris and the Regenerosa team for their story map that they shared with us, because in spite of all of the things that were kind of working against it, they have also tried to tap into some of the complexity of their bioregion. But that storytelling, that to me is what gets left out all the time. And it's actually the thing that is the biggest impediment to actually being able to ask the right questions and to go forward properly. So if this is like the beginning of something, which we hope is really big, I am so excited that it's getting off to this footing. I'm just like, I just want to be, just give you a huge hug. This is huge. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love you, Claire. <laughs> uh, RJ, on to you. Yes, uh, just short comments. Uh, the Mapathon, uh, watching that video, uh, that was excellent and gave such a good overview of what's going on in Barachara, uh, Barachara, the best, best I've seen so far. So, and, and I know you did a great job with that, Joe. <laughs> and there's so much there and it's just really the tip of the iceberg. So uh, what I'm thinking, maybe I can put it in context. Uh, right now here at Stonehenge, we're preparing, I'm not at Stonehenge, but I will be going up there. We're preparing to have 200 people from all over Pennsylvania and beyond for three days. And of course, hosting with, with food and, and camping and so many music events and so many yoga and other events. And it just strikes me, we've done several of these this, this summer and how complex just doing that is. Just, just the number of good people on the spot with a, with a very similar inspiration for being there. So what I keep thinking of, and I think it does get back to the storytelling I'm thinking of the storytelling also relating, I'm gonna call it the aftermath, not in a bad way, but the aftermath of what goes on because it's gonna be so intense, I'm sure, that, that week that people will be reeling with new ideas and then they will tend to go back to wherever they are and either forget some of them or go off in other directions, you know, good and tenuous, all those things. So I am thinking about the aftermath of that because you're going to shake up. You're going to shake up not only Barachar, you're going to shake up the world with it. So it's always remembering that this is a process, and I certainly don't have the answer to that. I just see it again and again. Uh, we have such good connections, and that it's hard to keep those connections going in a storytelling way, so that we can look at this together and go forward with that. And also, I think the impact, sorry, I'm going on a little bit longer. The impact on the people in Barachara is going to be very significant because they're going to have their own thoughts after this. You know, is this something really positive on an individual level for, for them and their particular projects that they've been working on with great heart? So just, just to add that. And uh, tremendous opportunity. I know you're really pulling it together, Joe. It's, it's pretty amazing. And it doesn't happen very often like that. Mm. Thanks. Thank you, RJ. And I know with your experience, you've, you've seen a lot of this over the years. Just a quick comment before passing to Stan that what I'm already wanting to attract and this is like the aspirational future is we're lucky that Sev and Sam from Ecolab are already planning to stay longer. They were living in Madison, Wisconsin, and they're like, we're digital nomads. We could just come and be there. And our project is so aligned with what you guys are doing that could we just come and do our project when you have this ecological asset mapping and value flows? Could we just do that in your community? And I'm like, uh, yes, you can. And so what's good is that we already have two really well-respected and beloved people within the community. Now they're, they both work with, with Regen Network and with others that they're like, they're known quantities within their small world. Yeah, they're in medicine, but not for long. Pretty soon they'll be in party chat. Um, and, uh, and what I think is really powerful is that by just saying there is someone who's staying for months afterwards, 
to develop their projects here, means others may come and join us afterwards to develop projects together with them. And, you know, it's always about scaffolding. And so I'm wanting to create this scaffolding for follow through that allows people to come back. People who come for the event, but then they have to leave. Like I already planted this with Evan when we talked the other day. Like, Evan, you're gonna come down and stay with us for a while? Um, you know, and it's because I feel like what we really need to do is create like a, a little like pop-up research institute that lasts for a few months or maybe lasts for a year. And people come and go from it just like they would at a university, except without all the bullshit of a university. Like just take all that bullshit away and just do it ourselves. So, so I'm already thinking about that and thinking about how we use crypto to raise the funds to enable us to let that happen. To just reach out into the crypto world and say, who would find us the $20,000 to support the spaces and the people and blah, blah, blah. Because I actually think the money will move easily if we have a good story. Um, but that's that's part of the aspirational space. On to you, Stan. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think everyone's starting with a thank you. I, I think that's the right message. Uh, and then I think it is, you know, I really liked Claire's validation of the, the storytelling. And I'd like to shout out to Jonathan and, you know, and to Todd. I think the idea of, you know, you've done a brilliant job of building trust. And we talk about raising money, but I think it's actually the raising of the trust uh, of these conversations in storytelling. And then we find out, you know, we don't need to own the land. We need to be custodians of the biodiversity. Um, and then the nice thing is these stories, you know, when I check them in my own backyard, they, they have value, right? It's not, you know, the kids aren't giving me money, but, but we are, you know, in our own backyard validating, you know, pulling weeds and, you know, doing, you know, even if we don't have the experts from the region network, you know, plant ID works. I can take a picture, look it up, uh, do the same thing with birds. And so we have a, you know, a family collection of biodiversity in our own backyards. And it just sort of started with flowers in a pot. But now we're eating, you know, heritage tomatoes and we're making, uh, you know, traditional traditional salsas and traditional stews and you know curries and stuff you know it's 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 a it's the season you know it's equinox by the way you know it's just the harvest harvest moon so so this is a really I think it is the stories and I think it is the the trust and then I really you know appreciate the leadership in Cascadia you know from Claire that we could do this at the Victoria level or the Nanaimo level or the Duncan level or, you know, Port Alberni. You know, we could do this with our friends wherever they are on whatever river. Um, so I think it is the stories. And then I think, you know, when, when you say the ecoversity, you know, this is pretty close to an ecoversity. When I look at the MIT of the future, you know, it's like this. When I look at the Georgia Tech of the future, it's like this. You know, the engineering curriculum for Georgia Tech is just like this. It's a virtual university. It's one of the best engineering programs. You know, the same thing with Stanford and MIT. Their courses are like this. So, so I think this is the way to sort of do. I always think of you as cultural evolution, and I think these pattern languages for. These key scenarios, this trauma, these whatever scenario, the trauma scenario, being able to talk about death or talk about your daughter, or talk about whatever, you know, I th I think that's that's the trust safety net that that we're really incubating here, you know, and, and now. So anyway, I just wanted to thank you for that, and I wanted to encourage the storytelling. I think that's for for me and my regenerative network, you know, my family network, you know, I'm talking to cousins that are rednecks, you know, they just got remarried and, you know, uh, lives back in Oklahoma, lives in Mo Independence, Missouri, uh, Missouri. Missouri, and, Missouri, <laughs> that's where I'm from, Missouri. <laughs> you know, these, these stories are very colorful. And now we're getting the good version of the stories. So, so thank you for getting us to here. I think this is at the heart of uh, well-being.
you know. Yeah, so thank, thank you. you for that, Stan. And I just want to comment briefly on what you said and what Iris put into the chat before going on to Stephen. Iris was asking about whether we had an implementation plan for bringing these from one region to another. And the answer is, uh, yeah, that was the idea all along. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't remember or didn't know, because you just didn't know me, is that back in 2019, when I was living in Costa Rica, trying to figure out how to create these bioregional projects and finding Co Costa Rica to have a lot more greenwashing than it's given credit for, it, um, uh, and a lot of beautiful stuff too, but a lot more green, a lot more greenwashing than it's given credit for. Uh, it's it's not as good as people like to think it is, um, because of other problems. And what I was thinking at the time was to create a design school for regenerating Earth. DSRE, and then one of my friends, Jeff McNeely, who was like, you'll have better naming if you call it the Design Institute for Regenerating Earth, because then the acronym is that it's dire, and this is a dire situation. I'm like, hmm, we'll call it the Design Institute for Regenerating Earth. And what we're doing right now was the, cur the curriculum of it that I envisioned then is what we're doing in this moment on this call. We're all learning together across bioregions and across skill sets, immersed in our lives using digital tools, a virtual university is not a university. Um, I don't know how many of you read my Medium article back in 2017 or something. I don't even remember when I wrote it, called Why Universities Are Failing Humanity. I pissed off about half of my academic friends and got like big high fives from half of my academic <laughs> friends for writing the article about how basically they're going to study the sinking Titanic as the Titanic sinks. You know, like we're going to have the best documented mass extinction event in history. <laughs> <laughs> right up until we're gone. And so we need something else. So the idea of creating an open access, globally available design school that shows us how to regenerate the earth, that was the idea. And then that idea grew into writing chapters of my book, which became a study group for the book, which became Earth Regenerators, which became, hi everyone, we're all here now. Um, you know, like here we are, <laughs> we're doing it. So yeah, the idea was always to be like a virtual ecoversity rather than a university, because all universities have existed within civilizations, and there are zero examples of sustainable civilizations. So maybe we want something a little different. So so yeah, um, we're in it right now. Welcome to the ecoversity, everyone. Stephen, on to you. <laughs> oh, wait, I can't hear you for some reason. What happened to your, to your sound? How about now? Yep, yep, there you are. Can you hear me now? Okay, yeah, I got too many devices connected to my Zoom. Um, one is a reflection. Uh, so I said two things. I've been reflecting on, on how do I hold, like I have a sense of complexity, but how do I communicate it? How do I really live inside of it with other people? And being being very brain heavy, in many ways, it's like, I, I can't talk about it all. But the people bringing up telling the stories and the importance of stories, it's like, from what I understand, that the complexity, particularly of the indigenous was held in the stories. It wasn't about knowing all the facts. So yeah, I, I, along with the others say, yes, you know, we need to be telling stories, um, sharing our story, however that is. Um, and then I can, when I realize that, then I can let go of, I need to understand or know all the other pieces, or even I need to orchestrate the other pieces, which actually that leads perfectly into my second piece, because um, as Joe knows, I, I, for this re by Barichara event, I've been trying to get some of the core team from the whole chain project to show up. And as far as I know, the, um, you know, Arthur and Frarananda, who are the two I've been working with on the currency design course, neither one of them are available. Uh, and I don't know for sure who all is going to be showing up, if anyone else. So I'm I'm the kind of the representative of from my place. And um, Jillian, you're part of that pro some project related to Holochain, right? You know, so there is some other representation, but I wanted Arthur there because he can really speak to to a lot of what's going on. But anyway, um, 
So I've been kind of like in this panic of how, like, you know, we're, some big opportunity is being missed. And if I surrender to the complexity, I find I get this text from Farinanda, who's working on a bunch of regenerative stuff too. And today's and, my birthday. Fernanda's birthday oh, today. Yeah. Oh, just, I didn't know that. Thank you. I'll have to flip it through. But uh, I was discussing with her some things around the the currency design course, and she sent me a message last night. Let me know if you want a discount coupon for the Bari Char community. Commons Engine is launching our Regen Communities cohort in Q1 of 2023. We are setting the ground for it, including aligning some sponsorship for those that can't pay. We are setting the ground for meta collaboration to emerge in the currency design space. So there's a conversation before Brief by Barichara that I'm working to set up between Joe and Fernanda so that we can really see what can be created for our community that supports their community and so forth. But, you know, it isn't showing up the way I want and it's still showing up inside the complexity and I don't need to try to understand and manage it all. So there's a little update for our, our RHR update is there is work on bringing in the world's foremost program on currency design, world's only program, as far as I know, on currency design into our community. Yeah, I think what's gonna be really important is that there's enough trust and mutual admiration you know, like Art and Fernando and I have known each other for a while, but we never actually collaborate because we're just all busy doing our own things. But then we look over and go, glad you're over there doing that. Me too. And and it's these, these long, those of us who have been around this game long enough, we know what it's like to have these mutual admirers. You know, we're like, I admire you, you admire me, but we don't get to do anything together. But we don't look at it as a missed opportunity because eventually we send people in our networks to each other eventually we find a way to weave it and it's almost always not us yeah and it's the, the thing that i that personally was kind of feel have been feeling disappointed in is a few of the conversations i've had with Fernanda about linking things up more she's involved i have no idea what she's involved in she just like mentions the name of something so i get a sense she's involved with other regen projects on the scope of what we're doing here or uh, broadly speaking, at least, you know, and I'm like, that's fine, but I want this over here because this is where I am and I'm not planning on going over where you are. So there is a, a per, perhaps the appropriate merging and I'm, I'm aware that I could be the lead conversation and I'm fine with that. It's just, I have lots of gaps that I can't fill right now. Um, so yeah, yeah, there's like, that whole piece of the, the proper cross-pollination will happen. If we create the field agile enough and open and inclusive enough, the cross-pollination will happen. I wanted to briefly comment on what you wrote, Jillian, into the chat about the Tyronas, because I wouldn't call them a civilization in the sense that I was meaning, because they also had an extensive, extensive trade network with the Federation of the Moisca, which are based in Bogota. And where we are, we're like in the nexus of those two federated trade patterns. And I know that the Muiscas lasted for 3,500 continuous years, right up until the time of the conquistadors. Um, and what I would say is I see them as being something more like the Iroquois nation. They were federations of tribes that maintained an indigeneity. Um, but I think that that is something that we don't wanna get too caught up in which word we use to describe things. Cause I think the Tyronas those you don't know, the Kogi people are part of the, the descendants of the previous Tyrona civilization. And now there are two tribes, two indigenous groups, one called Tyrona and one called Kogi. And they're both part of the same previous larger exchange network in the northern part of Colombia. Um, but I think it'll be fun for us to have conversations about what makes their societies complex and what makes them rich and what makes them indigenous and what makes them able to be sustainable. Because I think that there's a ton to talk about there, <laughs> which is where I would totally be aligned with you, I think, about um, about that topic without getting hung up on what the word civilization means, because we should you know, take a moment and another conversation and talk about that. But I wanted to acknowledge that because I think it's easy for us to get caught up on a word and be like, I actually disagree with you. Like, well, wait, actually, we probably don't disagree. We just got hung up on a word. And 
And it's gonna be good for us to have the flexibility to move through that. As I would say, who am I to say that Tyrone is more sustainable? I mean, my God, look at those guys. They're sending messages to little brother now and we are gonna listen. I think they know what they're talking about. <laughs> so I wouldn't dismiss them because of the word. I'd be like, yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to acknowledge that um, since you've written that into the chat. Um, on to you, Mitty. Thanks, Joe. I just want to loop back to what you were speaking to and what Stephen was speaking to, because I noticed what seems quite often to be an, an unchallenged assumption in the field that connecting is always valuable. Um, getting the people who are saying the same things together is always necessary. Uh, and I, I really like what you spoke to, Joe, about, you know, these people and you and you know each other and, and yet you never actually get necessarily to join directly together, but other ones do. Um, I, I just feel we really need to trust the connections that get made and not use too much energy on the connections that don't get made because I don't think nature sits worrying about the seeds that don't grow. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a really big deal because, um, you know, as, as you know, Mitty, I studied pattern formation in complex adaptive systems when I was a graduate student. And it turns out that the way that patterns form is this combination of pre-existing structure, which is the scaffold of continuing entrenchment and development, and the not yet structured, which is in the realm of potential structures that might emerge or potential patterns that might emerge. And it's the interaction between the two that matters. And so if we try to force the scaffolding or force the entrenchment, try to make it do something it's not naturally doing, then you know, we fail to learn lessons like the Wu Wei concept of Taoism. Whereas like if you find harmony with the pattern as it's emerging, then you find that you can be like a surfer. You have the power of the entire wave behind you. But if you try and work against the wave and make it do something else, you're just fighting reality. And this is true for social webs as well that often there are, are subtle but important reasons why weaving of people doesn't happen. And I know that I have created my fair number of, of schisms in the regenerative movement because I talk about collapse when other regenerative leaders aren't comfortable talking about it yet. Daniel Christian Vall openly named that in a Doomer, Doomer Optimist panel that I was on with Daniel, with Nora Bateson, and with Kate Raworth. All three of them were nervous about talking about collapse, and they were all keeping their distance from me because they were afraid of the reputational fallout and their own psychological barriers to accepting collapse. And until Daniel said it in that interview, no one had said it. Now, I knew it for years. I knew exactly that was what was going on. But that's not a problem. You know, I'm friends with all of them. They're all friends with me. I don't need to be actively collaborating with them. And actually, I think there are some very interesting um, blind spots for, um, I'm gonna think specifically of Kate Raworth's work of trying to give people a dose of hope by believing cities can be sustainable. That's uh, just more or less what she said in that interview. Uh, she was just staying with that because she thought that did good. And I'm like, I take Michael Dowd's approach, which is the longer we continue the life destroying system, the more life destroying it becomes. And actually trying to keep cities going that are, that are at their core unsustainable, actually takes us further into overshoot, more extinction, you know, um, more mass extinction, more species lost, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, Michael Dowd uses the word evil and he has a definition of it in his videos. But I actually think trying to perpetuate cities longer in the way that they're configured now actually leads to more death and destruction at a larger scale later. And so, so there are things like that that I would have a disagreement with someone about and yet still be their friend and still be able to sit on a panel with them and share ideas and be very constructive and be beautiful and love their work and be happy for them and not collaborate. And so I think that this way of understanding the diversity of strategies and tactics is the key. We really need the diversity of strategy and tactics because Kate Raworth is doing beautiful, amazing work. Did you notice I didn't diss her work overall? I just picked one thing that I have a little pet peeve about that for me is important, but 
she helped develop the planetary boundaries framework, which I use all the time. Do you notice the planetary boundaries is a donut? That's not by accident. Kate Raworth worked with the Stockholm Resilience Center to create the, the planetary boundaries framework, which I use all the damn time. And so I'm celebrating Kate's work, whether I name her or not, you know, when I'm celebrating the importance of that work, whether I agree with her on cities or not. And we have to have this nuance to be able to do this work because it's just too complex what we're doing. Um, I'm noticing that we're at the hour mark and slightly beyond, and I want to honor time and say, um, I'm happy to go a little longer if people would like to, um, but I'm, and I'm also happy to, you know, re, um, hold space for more comments and dialogue. So I just want to see, is there anyone who has something they'd like to share? If not, no worries, no pressure. Um, one thing I want to suggest is that as you watch what we're doing in Barichara, just keep thinking about the pattern level of human relationship. How are we collaborating? How are we not? How are we gathering resources? What do our economic models actually look like? How, I mean, remember, economic systems are distribution of materials, distribution of resources. You know, economics is about the movement of resources within an ecosystem, which is why I tend to associate them with trophic flows and food webs as a way of getting back to ecological economics. And so how does this economy work? Right now we have a knowledge economy between us in this conversation. How did it work? What are we actually doing here? What does it mean that some of us are here on this call and others will watch this later on YouTube? You know, what does it mean that some of us will be at Refi Barichara physically there and others won't? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, what are we actually doing here? And what I see us doing is we're doing our version of the moonshot. We're in a moment where we get one chance to get this right. And our one chance to get it right is something like about 10 years. Which if you remember when John Kennedy said, I wanna put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, which I think was 1961 that he said that, wasn't it? Someone who's older to remember, but it was about a decade. And here we are with our moonshot is to have a planetary network of bioregional economies by 2030. And so that's our moonshot. Not to get to the space age, but to get to the earth age. And, and we're in it right now right now in this call and what we're doing, we are in it. And how do we do what happened with NASA in the 1960s in a US context? How do we gather the best minds? How do we collaborate well? How do we build the infrastructure and the institutions that are appropriate to these challenges? And how do we do it in this geopolitical context that we're in? And so, so here we are. And one reason I would advocate for crypto is that I don't want the Federal Reserves of the world deciding how this thing gets funded. I don't want the billionaires like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, these absolutely insane sociopaths, I don't want them deciding the future of humanity is upload us to Silicon and plant us on Mars until Earth is habitable again. I think that is insane. And so, so we got to gather not just the best minds, we got to gather the best hearts the best heart-mind duos. And so, um, so here we are, we're in it. And it's just gonna ramp up from here. And if you think this is complex, just wait. It's gonna get pretty overwhelming pretty soon. And so we've gotta find a way to hold that because um, we're in the quickening now. Uh, yeah, that's a reference to the Highlander movies of the 80s, <laughs> for those of you who know those. The best Queen album ever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I'm, I'm definitely dating myself. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so stay, stay tuned, stay involved, get more involved. Um, we had about 250 people who had funded our Gitcoin campaign by this morning. It's about 260 by this afternoon. The whole thing ends in seven hours. And I already sent a little video message to everyone who funded us, asking them to start thinking about how we can collaborate because a lot of those people are just dropping money into Gitcoin grants, but some of them are future allies. And so we're just planting seeds everywhere for collaboration. And then we're gonna show people we mean it by actually doing it. And so um, help us make it true that we know how to collaborate because I'm gonna be very overwhelmed with how much collaboration needs to happen really soon. 
and you're all going to be like, oh, Joe's, Joe really is a human. He <laughs> fucked that one up. Like, you guys are going to see a lot of that coming. <laughs> and so, um, so yeah, I just want to invite that in. Just, uh, you know, how are you co-creating in this and how are we going to do it together? Um, because this is about to get real. Um, so thanks, everyone. And onward we go.